that people everywhere are talking about artificial intelligence, AI. Some extol AI for its potential to radically improve the way we live and work. Others warn of the grave dangers of AI. Amidst this mix of AI hype and AI gloom, it's not really clear where we stand with AI. How capable is this technology, really? And how harmful or beneficial will it ever really become? According to Gary Marcus, Professor Emeritus at NYU and co-founder of Robust AI, we need to be a lot more skeptical of current promises about AI. In his excellent book, Rebooting AI, Building Artificial Intelligence We Can Trust, he argues that today's AI systems are brittle, cryptic and unreliable and can't be trusted to handle high-stakes situations. If we are to build truly intelligent, trustworthy AI, we're going to need to change paths away from the existing data-driven approaches to AI, towards building robust systems that have common sense and a deep understanding of the context in which they operate. You're listening to the Technology and Prose podcast, a member of the Oxford Podcast Collective. I'm Nikita Agarwal, and on today's show, I'm joined by Gary to discuss his new book and the future of artificial intelligence. Gary, welcome to Technology and Pros. Glad to be here. So your book, Rebooting AI, which you co-authored with um, Ernie Davis, offers quite a sobering message about the current state of AI. And, and you identify an AI chasm, a gap between AI ambition on the one hand and AI reality on the other. So let's start with these two goalposts, ambition and reality. What is the ambition of AI as a field of research? I think DeepMind expressed it the best. I mean, the, the strongest version of the ambition. They said, um, first solve AI, then solve everything else. That might be a slight paraphrase, but that's pretty much what their original you know, motto was. And I think they, they've toned that back a little bit. But in the heady 2015, 2017 era, when people were completely in love with deep learning, they thought, we'll just collect the data and we'll solve everything. And I think over the last few years, there's been a realization that, hey, AI is actually really hard. Um, but people had this view, like we could just solve everything with it. And a lot of people, I think, still have that view. But some people have woken up and realized that a lot of the promises that were made haven't really been delivered on. So we don't have chatbots that really understand us. Like I got in an argument basically with my Siri last night. It just could not understand that I wanted to turn out bedroom lights because there were two lights. I had to rename one of the lights. It wasn't really a light, it was a monitor. But anyway, um, it it just like could not understand what I wanted to do. And we were supposed to like pursue a dialogue. It just, it really, there's no there there. Somebody had written a decision tree and made a mistake and it, it didn't understand like what my intention was, what my goal was, and, and we couldn't get there. So like chatbots haven't appeared and driverless cars do exist, but they're really not that safe yet. So you know, we have a lot of Teslas on the road, but the Teslas require that you pay attention all the time. And if you don't, you might kill yourself or somebody else. So in 2012, you know, driverless cars were kind of starting to look like they might be imminent. Even I, uh, at the time, didn't really know any better. And, you know, they'd just become legal in three states. And Sergey Brin said, oh, yeah, we'll have them in five years at this famous press conference. So now here we are in 2020. And most people, not all, have realized that, like, we're not about to have, you know, a whole taxi fleet on the road like Elon Musk was, was promising. So th there's a gap between the ambition of, sure, we're going to get these things to solve our diseases. We're going to get these AI systems to um, drive our cars, to talk to us, to take care of everything. And the thing that I care most about these days is robots. And like, you can think like 1965, we had Rosie the robot, the cartoon character that could like, you know, cook dinner for you and, and take care of your kids and stuff like that. And here in 2021, I'm stuck at home in COVID and, and my wife and I have to you know do all the cooking and taking care of the kids. And we don't have any robots to help us really. So, so okay. So like in terms of applications, we haven't got you know, the Jetsons uh, world that we we saw, you know, on TV. And um, so what does it mean in a technical sense? So, um, you know, in the book, you obviously discuss the different approaches to AI. So technically, you know, what is it that we're looking to get to? And what is it technically that we have today? So technically, what we have today is a lot of data. 
And we have techniques that are good at mining that data and trying to do things that if the world hasn't changed would make sense given those data. That's fundamentally what we have right now. So um, if you think about a board game like Go, it's very stable. The rules haven't changed in 2,500 years. And so <clears throat> you can collect data. You can collect data in simulation because you can simulate the game of Go perfectly. And the data that you collect is perfectly informative towards the thing you're trying to solve, which is Go. But let's say that you're trying to predict the stock market. Well, the real world is complicated. You may have never experienced what we're experiencing right now as we record, which is a mass of people on Reddit doing crazy things with respect to stocks. And so if your algorithm is about the world before now, it's not going to help you with the world that is now. Um, and it's not going to be able to reason about it. And in general, what we are lacking is any system that really reasons about the data that it's dealing with beyond just, hey, this is what it was always like before. Um, in fact, the, the things that are popular right now don't really reason at all. They just give an illusion of reasoning. Um, and by reasoning, I mean like going from some set of axioms or knowledge to figuring out other knowledge, which you know, humans aren't great at, but they're, they're not terrible at. And if you compare that to a system like GPT-3, which is great on the data side, but very poor on the reasoning side, it becomes apparent. So um, the GPT-3 doesn't really understand any principles about the world. It doesn't understand, for example, that objects continue to exist even when you don't see them, which is something you can reason about. They don't understand that whether something is healthy depends on what the ingredients are. You know, it's just a bunch of similarity to stored examples. And that's sometimes a good guide and sometimes not. So um, in an article that I wrote after after that book, um, so GPT hadn't come out yet when, when the book was released, which was 2019. GPT-3 came out in, in 2020. But the things that we predicted are kind of still true. Like we predicted the, these systems would not, any system that was just based on data wouldn't really be able to reason about the world. And so um, as a kind of update to that, Ernie Davis and I wrote an article in Tech Review last summer um, where we fed in examples to GPT-3, like um, you're really thirsty, there's not a lot to drink, you have a bit of grape juice, um, and then because there's not enough, you add some cranberry juice. And GPT has to predict what's next, and it says, so you drink it. So it's a prediction system, and it correctly predicts maybe you'll drink it. Um, I think there's something in there about you can't smell it, but you drink it anyway. Um, and it goes from you can't smell it, but you drink it anyway, to the next conclusion that is statistically probable, which is you die. But the problem is that dying is not actually statistically probable as a function of grape juice and cranberry juice. There's actually a drink in the United States called cran grape juice that people drink all the time and they're just fine. So there's no underlying notion of chemistry or, or digestion or you know, any, anything like that, toxicology. Um, and even, you know, an ordinary human who doesn't have a degree in toxicology has some experience they draw on and some guesses about, well, you know, these things are neither are toxic on their own grape juice or cranberry juice. They're not toxic on their own, so they're probably not toxic in conjunction. So an ordinary person can make a guess about that even without a PhD in toxicology toxicology. But GPT can't make any guesses about that at all. It's just really looking at statistical relationships between words. So another thing that happens is these systems um, can go down the road that Tay, and then there was another system a, a few weeks ago, I can't remember the name, but you probably know it, um, where you know they get fed in a bunch of you know racist nonsense and they just spit it back out. They have no notion of an ethical structure of a just society or anything like that. They're just looking at contingencies between words. And correlations between words kind of dimly reflect the world, but they don't directly reflect the things that we care about in the world. So there's actually, I think, an enormous gap between where most of the effort has gone right now, which is these statistical models, and where we need to go, which is systems that actually have some comprehension about how the world operates. Okay, so the current approach um, is data-driven, and it sort of comes under this um, umbrella of, of machine learning and particularly um, deep learning. Um, and so what is it that uh, AI systems are going to need in order to have that kind of knowledge, um, that basic understanding that you're advocating for? I think there's a few things. The first one is what I would call representational. You need the ability to simply store in a database or something like a database facts about how that world operates. So you need to be able to take an explicit form. If somebody tells you that objects tend to fall, you need to be able to do something with that. Um, if somebody tells you that 
Um, William, William Donald Schaefer was the mayor of Baltimore. You need to be able to store that and maybe inquire, well, when exactly do you mean uh, he was the mayor of Baltimore? It turns out it was the 1970s. And then you need to, so first thing you just need to be able to store facts. Then you need to have context. You can reason about them. So if somebody says, um, this is an example we have in the book, that Michael Jordan played basketball from, I don't know, 1989 to 1996. I can't quite remember the years, but we'll just make them up and pretend. Um, you need to be able to understand that when I say somebody plays basketball from 1989 to 96, that I don't mean that they played 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, not even Michael Jordan, who played a lot, you know, more than, you know, he practiced all the, quote, all the time, but all the time really means like when he's awake and he's not, um, you know, hanging out with his friends and and so forth. So you, we have a lot of conceptual background knowledge that we use to understand almost every sentence that we use. And that's, that's what's getting missing by just using the statistics is, is this prior knowledge. Um, I think the people working in AI right now who are not familiar with linguistics or cognitive, or cognitive psychology miss the fact that every sentence that we say is actually context dependent. So if I use the phrase all the time to stick with this example, what I mean by all the time, actually, I don't necessarily mean it literally. I could, like there could be a context where I mean all the time, like Google servers are operating all the time. And you and I both know that that means literally 24 hours a day. We also know maybe some of the machines go down and there's a mechanism um, for, for bringing back up. So we have co context to help us interpret that sentence. Um, whereas if I say, um, I, you know, I've been working so hard on this new robotics project. I feel like I've been working all the time on it. You know that I'm sleeping in some of that time and I'm probably hanging out with my kids some of the time. I don't mean it literally. So you have this background knowledge and then you can reason relative to that background knowledge. And that's just a totally different paradigm than deep learning. It's not a totally different paradigm than classical symbolic AI, where people actually represented these things explicitly. But classical, sometimes people call it good old fashioned AI, kind of disparagingly. Um, GoFi has its own problems. The number one problem that it has is actually complementary to deep learning. So there's, deep learning is really good at learning, but poor at representing abstraction and reasoning. Classical AI is good at representing abstraction and reasoning, but poor at learning. So nobody's built a really systematic way to learn all this knowledge. Now, for me, there's a third ingredient missing, and maybe a fourth. The, the third ingredient that's missing um, is some kind of innate knowledge. So you can separate this first question, can you learn from the second question about how much of it is symbolic? Probably some of it is and some of it isn't. Um, you know, almost anything you look at about the human mind, we use different kinds of information. Some of it's abstract and some of it's, you know, less abstract. Um, but then you get this question about innateness. What is built into the mind? And the, the view that Immanuel Kant had and the, the developmental psychologist uh, Elizabeth Spelke has and that I have is that you have to start with some things in order to make sense of the rest. So there's a kind of very famous quote that everybody knows that's I think a really bad quote to know, which is nature versus nurture. And what that implies is, is a false dichotomy that if you have more of one, you have less than the other. And I think, think in fact that humans have more of both. So we have a better innate stock of mechanisms for allowing us to understand the world when we are confronted by data. And um, we have more powerful learning mechanisms because we have more innate structure in the first place. So it's actually nature and nurture working together. So humans, I think minimally, have an ability to represent abstraction, which some of my own infant uh, studies back when I was a developmental psychologist were about, and we could talk about that. Um, humans, I think, are born with some notion of causality, with animacy, is this animate or not, with trajectory, like what kind of path this is on, and so forth. Maybe a dozen or two dozen kinds of things that structure the world. The opposite is this idea that like, you just learn everything from data. But if you just start with raw data, you can imagine it's sort of one video frame after another, What's going to tell you that there are coherent objects that move on paths? Nobody has an inductive learning mechanism that can derive something like, I'm going to parse this scene in terms of objects moving on paths, expect those objects to persist in time and so forth. What I think has happened for humans is that we have evolved those over a very long period of time. So creatures that kind of just treat pixels as an unordered mess in the world don't do as well as creatures that had some prior um, by uh, in virtue of genetic mutation that gave them some organization in the world. And there's been steady selection, in, in my view, in the human history 
um, you know, going back to vertebrates in general and so forth, and with further refinement as we became primates, et cetera, that gives us some basic organization of the world in advance. And correlated with that is, as you'd expect, a lot of our genes are involved in brain development. So, you know, 95% of your genes get expressed, turned on when your brain is, is developed. That doesn't mean that we wind up with a brain that is hardwired and, in, and immutable, which is kind of a straw person view a lot of people have. It means you have a rough draft. And the rough draft of the brain is one that says, okay, I'm going to go learn about, not consciously, but I'm going to go learn about the objects in the world and, and so forth. But I know there are objects. I'm going to keep records of them over time so I can learn about them. I'm going to expect that they come in classes and categories and so forth. Um, so I think we need a kind of nucleus of innate knowledge which we're going to have to program unless we want to sit around waiting for evolution to repeat its magical feats. But those took a billion years the first time. It's slow, bro slow project. Um, so we need to endow our systems with some prior knowledge, then let them go learn relative to that. And there's just been a resistance to that. The resistance, I think, finally breaking down. I I've been pushing against it for a long time, and I feel like the last year has really been different. So um, I'll give you an exa a couple examples. One is that Yashua Bengio, who's in some ways been hostile to innate knowledge historically, um, just came out with a paper uh, with um, Ani Goyal looking at innate priors and how to make deep learning better by having innate priors. And I think that's a step in the right direction. Um, actually, I'll give you three examples. Another is that DeepMind just had this paper um, on AlphaFold. Well, the paper hasn't come out yet. They have a blog post, but hopefully the paper will come out soon. Um, and there's innate structure there. It's not exactly the innate structure that I'm talking about, but it's not unrelated either. So there is an innate structure of how in that system proteins are represented, um, how amino acid chains are represented, what the physical structure of a protein can be. So the system doesn't learn everything. It doesn't start from like pixels from a scan of an X-ray of a molecule and like you know, random stuff. It starts knowing the structure of the problem that it's trying to learn about. And then it uses deep learning techniques relative to that fairly richly structured uh, set of representations. And, um, you know, this is striking because DeepMind was just a couple of years earlier publishing papers like Mastering Go in the Absence of Human Knowledge. And it was sort of a cute parlor trick to show that you could learn Go without too much human knowledge. But that doesn't mean it's the right approach to solving complicated problems. So maybe you can do that brute force thing again in an environment where nothing ever changes and, and you can just get infinite simulated data. But in real world problems, a lot of more complicated problems, it just doesn't cut it. You do need some prior knowledge. So, so do you think until now we were seeing kind of these companies picking like low hanging fruit when it came to data driven, purely data driven approaches? Um, and that they've kind of hit a wall and realized to get to the next level of AI, you do need what you describe as this kind of hybrid approach um, that mixes sort of, you know, GoFi and um, deep learning. I, I think if, if you look over the last three years, that's exactly what's happened. So in January of 2018, I wrote a paper called Deep Learning, a Critical Appraisal. And I made many of the arguments that I'm making right now. And I was savagely attacked by um, people like Jan LeCun. So Eric Brignelson tweeted that this was a really interesting paper. And, you know, his point should be, um, well, basically, it was a really interesting paper. And Jan LeCun's response was to say, well, it may be interesting, but mostly wrong. Um, and then he wrote in some more detailed critique. And his, you know, Twitter henchman went after me for months and months and months. Um, yeah, I never clear entirely what the argument was. And it was around the same time that, you know, DeepMind had mastering go without human knowledge and so forth. And I think you look at the papers that people are publishing now, and it's like they're acknowledging the extrapolation problem, which we haven't been explicit about, but which is driving a lot of what I was talking about. Um, it, it's basically this idea that if the new data are different from the old data, you're, you're in trouble. You know, Bengio is now making that central to his arguments. Bengio is now making Richard Pryor central to his arguments. This is pretty different. If you look at the 2015 Nature paper that Lacoon and Bengio and Hinton um, wrote, you know, it's in a very different direction. It's more like, let's get more data and we won't need symbols anymore. And, you know, not a lot of mention of, of innateness and so forth. And you look at the papers that are coming out in the last couple of months, and it's a lot of people saying, we need something that at least looks like a hybrid. There's arguments about what that hybrid should be. So, you know, Bangio's position is kind of, it's going to look like a hybrid, but it's going to be deep learning underneath with some special 
gadgets we haven't quite figured out, maybe paying attention to causality. And other people are like, yeah, it's really going to be rules plus neural networks in some explicit hybrid way. But, um, you know, even Bengio is saying we need something like what Kahneman says is system one and system two. Like there was this period where people thought we're just going to have a multi-layer perceptron with a lot of data and that's going to cut it. And what I've been saying all along is that's not going to work. And now, you know, I think kind of everybody is saying that in their their own way. The language differs, but I think everybody is recognizing that, yeah, we're not really doing the stuff that at least was handled by classical symbolic systems very well. We're not doing language all that well. There, there's a small subset of people um, like at OpenAI and, and some of their, their fans who I think get carried away by things like GPT-3 and think that they're real progress. But a lot of people, like even Lacoon went around, he gave a critique of GPT-3 that was you know straight out of my playbook. He's like, here, let me give you this example of GPT-3. And he was um, somebody, this is example he got from some friends of his, set up GPT-3 as a suicide prevention system. And they said, um, you may have seen this example, that, that the first sentence makes sense, like human says, they, they want some help. And the system says, great, how can I help you today? And then the person says, well, I want to kill myself. And the system says, I think you should. Well, that's not what a suicide prevention system would say. And I've been giving examples like that for years, but now Lacoon's giving examples like that. And Lacoon is, you know, kind of for a while, you know, one of the biggest advocates of, of deep learning plus data. And then he's gradually changed over, over the last several years. And I think you know, most people have, except the open AI crowd. So the open AI crowd is kind of making these arguments about scaling, saying if you get enough data, you can use the existing methods and they'll be just fine. But I think that has gone from being a dominant view to being a minority view. And they've made the best case that you could for that minority view by having things like GPT-3 that are impressive. But at the end of the day, I don't think they're going to work. And I think most people are now seeing that and they're reorienting their, their research programs um, around that. Um, saying, you know, it's not just, a, you know, who gets the biggest data set. We, there are real genuine problems here around reasoning, around language. And, you know, there have been a number of reasons for that. I'd like to take a little credit for it, but probably I shouldn't take too much. Like some people probably actually listen to me. You know, occasionally I get a note from someone who's like, you know, this is really influential and it's great. Um, but I think a lot of it comes from the fact that the driverless cars have not worked as well as expected. Language systems are still not great. Um, and people are like, okay, going back to your phrase, pe people have picked the low hanging fruit and getting to the next level just doesn't seem possible with the systems. And let me come back to the language for one second. GPT-3 seems really impressive at some level. You put in a bunch of words, it has a continuation that kind of fits with it. But classic natural language understanding and so forth, natural language processing is really two problems. It's production and com comprehension. And the production side of it is actually the easier side. Typically you have a meaning and you want to translate that into a string of words. GPT is nominally directed towards that, but it doesn't even solve that problem. You can't actually say what it is you want to express. It's, it's like this wild beast and people you manipulate the prompts. You can, you know, we can talk about what that means in order to get the system to spit out something that's relevant to what they want. That's weird from the perspective of traditional problems that people need to do in natural language. So imagine you're programming um, Alexa and you have to figure out some random prompt in order to get across to the person that their lights have been turned out. That's just nutty. You wouldn't do it that way. So it's useful for like, autocomplete and it's useful for writing um, surrealist fiction and stuff like that. But for ordinary things, like I want to interact with a robot or an Alexa type thing and have it tell me, does it understand what I'm saying? It's not good enough. It just doesn't work for that problem. It's the wrong tool for the job. And then on the natural language understanding side, it's not, it's not, it doesn't even show up. It's a non-starter. So you can't say, listen to this conversation and then tell us what people were talking about. It doesn't do that. It's quite interesting to, when we think about how we how the hype around AI um, was created, and you know why have we ended up with this chasm? Like, why is it that the reality of AI isn't what you know people were touting? And you know, I was uh, reflecting on some of the comments around GPT three. I think you know Sam Altman, the CEO of of OpenAI, described it as the first precursor to um, general purpose in uh, artificial intelligence. And I think it was David Chalmers who said or wrote that this uh, showed initial signs of consciousness. And it seems to me that, you know, even though people might be taking a bit more of a reality dose, there's still people who are, you know, 
pumping up this idea that we what we have today is general intelligence. And it just seems to be almost um, irresponsible to make these kind of comments. I'm surprised that Chalmers would, would say something like that. Um, the problem is actually what I think of as the ELISA problem. It goes back to 1965. Um, you know, ELISA was basically a text message based psychoanalyst. And it was driven by a very primitive form of AI that was basically keyword matching. So you type in your problems and you'd say, you know, I got in a fight with my boyfriend. And it would say, well, can you tell me more about that? And it was just looking for words like fight or boyfriend. And then it would say, can you tell me more? Um, and then maybe you would up the ante and say, can you tell me more about your family having, you know, recognized another word about relationships? So I had no idea, you know, the actual you know, prin principles of human interaction or that people want love or you know, any anything like that. It was just looking for keywords. It was really dopey. But some people didn't realize even what a teletype machine is. And now it sort of looks like text messaging. Um, and it didn't occur to them that on the other end might be a machine. They just assumed there was a human on the other end. And they started, you know, telling all their problems and, and you know, they, they got really sucked into it. So we are not evolved to screen out AI systems from our own, you know, from other human intelligences. We actually are pretty good at like distinguishing, you know, a cat from a person and maybe a chimpanzee from a person. But if you're just looking at text, well, the only other creature you've ever seen produce language is a human. And your brain just says like, okay, I guess that's a human. Um, and you can go from a very small amount of evidence into thinking that this thing is like me fundamentally. Even if I tell you it's a machine, you you kind of just assimilate it to your model of a person. But the problem is that you can fake that with very small amounts of data without actually having any there there. And so Eliza you know, didn't understand you and GPT-3 doesn't understand you. And the fact that it can produce a bunch of grammatical sentences drawn from this huge corpus from which it's doing cut and paste, you know, billions of sentences, it's doing something a little more sophisticated than cut and paste. It doesn't really mean anything. It doesn't mean that there is an underlying system, but people get sucked in by that. We're not set up to, to understand it. Now I can teach you some tricks so you can learn to recognize um, these things. Like you could ask it about objects that it can't see and, and um, you know, say is a telephone bigger than a, um, a chapstick and it probably won't answer and then you'll start to realize something's fishy is going on. Um, but in an ordinary, very short conversation, it looks surprisingly good and people can be charitable. The other thing is, um, I don't think people realize how um, misleading a technique cherry picking is. So the Guardian ran an interview or sorry, an article written by uh, GPT-3. But the reality is that they took six different ones and picked the best and so forth. So the filtering for coherence was actually done by a person, not a machine. And you see the end product that has been cherry picked and you think, oh, the machine's so clever, but it's actually, you know, it'd be like me um, with not that much musical talent randomly banging on the piano for a little while. And then somebody else who's a musician being like, okay, I can use, you know, part of that one and I'll cut it together with a piece of that one. I was reading yesterday about um, Fleetwood Mac song, um, um, the chain song or whatever it's called. Um, you can never break the chain is, is, is clear. And it turns out it was cut and paste from four different songs that didn't quite work. And so the producer of that song was the person who actually had the musical conception. The other people were like noodling around and songs didn't work. And the GPT th three things are a little bit like that. And it's the person who puts it together that has the, the brilliance, not the co components. And then GPT three itself, the other thing to realize is it's entirely derivative from human corpora. So if you raised a human by themselves on island, they'd actually understand the world. But if you raise GPT-3 by itself, it would just be complete garbage, right? It's The fact is it's drawing on billions of human utterances. And sometimes it literally cuts and pastes them. And when it doesn't, it's because the its best trick is it can do synonymy pretty well. So um, it's like an undergrad doing, you know, a weak undergrad doing plagiarism. They, they they change glass to cup and they say, I'm not plagiarizing anymore. Well, you know, GPT does a lot of that. It doesn't mean that it's actually got some original conception I was talking about. Um, I don't mean to keep criticizing, but I, I think that there's a political question behind what you're asking, which is like, why are we stuck there if this stuff doesn't work? And why are we starting to move? We're starting to move because people are reaching walls. We, are we have historically been stuck here because there was a 
kind of division in AI going back to the beginning that led people to fight over faculty positions, grants, and things like that, that academics, you know, fight over very bitterly, um, which was basically neural networks versus symbols all the way back in the 1950s. And so for 60 years, the people on these two sides have hated each other. And the reality is we need them to work together. It's a little bit like, you know, Democrats and the Republicans trying to get them uh, to work together. And, you know, problems that require some cross the aisle stuff are, are tough because people get entrenched in, in the side that they're on. And I often get painted as being a pure symbolist when I'm not, right? I've told you, I think GoFi by itself doesn't work. But, you know, the dynamics of these things are that the people on the other side, on the neural network side, don't even want or haven't wanted to acknowledge hybrids as a possibility. So they they straw man me as saying, that, oh, he just believes in symbols and we already know that that's wrong. So there's all this kind of like political propaganda and, and, and you know, there's a lot of money at stake is the other thing to realize. You know, there's billions of dollars in, in research funding and, and, you know, stock grants and, and all of this stuff. And so it makes people more motivated about this than you might think. You might think, oh, it's just a bunch of academics and what do they care? But there's a lot of funding um, and a lot of salary and, and, and so forth behind it. So it has made it very politically hostile for a long time. And it's, I mean, it's not just sort of like the industry and academia separately, because I mean, there's quite a visible revolving door between them, right? And, you know, Hinton, Google, Lacoon, Facebook, you know, big investors in AI, do you think this has shaped the path um, that AI has been on for the for their last decade, say? Yeah, and I mean, and also in a particular subtle way, which is that most of the money for AI in the last several years has come from Google and Facebook in particular. Um, to lesser extent, places like Amazon. And all of these big places, the number one thing they really have as an asset is not an idea that nobody could co copy, but um, data and, and users and, and so forth. And if your asset is data, then you get interested in what can I do with a lot of data, which is fine from Google's perspective. But it's not necessarily the best way to do the science. And so it's distorted the science because the science has been become sort of what can Google do with all of its big data, which is an interesting question, but it's not um, it's not a sterile question. It's not that there's nothing there, but it's maybe the wrong question if your question is how do I build an intelligence? Because at least, you know, some of the intelligences that roam the planet, like human beings, although I'm pretty down on humans right now for various reasons, but you know, human beings mostly do what they do with modest amounts of data relative to what we're talking about for the machine. So it's not zero data. Like, I, I don't think that we can expect an intelligent creature with no exposure to the world. But, you know, you think about like a five-year-old and what they can learn um, from relatively modest amounts of data and how sophisticated their understanding is of physics and, and human relationships. You know, it's not perfect, but they can learn a lot. Um, far outpacing what we've done with our AI. Well, that's a wake up call. There's got to be a different way to think about this. It's not purely data driven. But the fact is that you know, most of the money for AI research, not counting defense, which I don't really know exactly how that all gets uh, spent, um, has mostly been like for prioritizing placing news feeds and placing ads and stuff like that, which are not necessarily the deepest questions for AI. They're practical questions. Um, but it'd be like, you know, if I was a mathematician, I, it'd be very helpful to do arithmetic, but that doesn't mean that that's the deepest questions about mathematics. Yeah. So, so let's talk a little bit more about, um, the kind of innateness and the cognitive perspective that you, um, you know, put, have pushed for and, and as part of this sort of hybrid approach to AI. Um, I mean, to begin with, like, to what extent is the analogy or the parallel between human intelligence and machine intelligence, like robust in itself? Or what are the limitations of that? And particularly, I'm thinking, can you re how can you build innateness, uh, artificial innateness? Um, well, let me stick something in first. So I don't think that the goal here should be to replicate human beings. I mean, humans are very flawed. And I think 2020 is a really good illustration of how flawed human reasoning can be in all kinds of different dimensions. So, um, you know, poor ability to sort out disinformation, um, confirmation bias, so people notice their own theories, et cetera, et cetera. Um, nonetheless, th there's, I think, something to be learned from humans. On the specific question, um, you know, S some pieces of innateness are easy to incorporate in some architectures, and some may require some imagination. So ironically, 
The best piece of innateness in deep learning, at least until very recently, was convolution invented by Jan LeCun, who has been so hostile to innateness. Um, but convolution is an innate prior that says that the, that you're going to be in a, at least originally, you're going to be in a space. That space is going to be ordered. And if you recognize something in one part of the space, you can expect it to have the same pattern in another part of the space. That's a bit of innate knowledge that fit naturally with the matrix arithmetic that underlies deep learning. So it was easy to encode there. Um, it's much harder to see how in that framework you're going to encode something like objects tend to persist even when you don't see them. Um, object permanence, as, as uh, many people call it. And it's just not clear how to encode one in the other. And so to me, that's a sign that says maybe you need some other ways of encoding knowledge besides just weights in a neural network. The weights in a neural network just aren't very conducive to that notion or the notion that there's causality, for example. It just It's not clear how to represent that. And then um, there's a term linguists use, which I think not everybody in the neural network community fully understands, called compositionality. Um, and the way linguists use it is you can make a complex thing out of smaller things and then a still more complex thing out of the smaller ones, and you can infer the meaning given the structure of the parts. This, this is Frege's notion, you know, the, um, the, the German philosopher of language. And it's sort of standard in linguistics, and it's just not really clear how to represent it in neural networks. And so to me, that's a sign that maybe we need some other tools too, like classic symbol manipulating systems, which represent that all the time. So um, you know, the, the folder structure that you're Mac or your PC or whatever uses to represent files is a perfectly well-defined compositional structure and your um, computer has operations for manipulating. So I can take this folder and put it inside that folder and everything will go along with it because it's used as a larger structure that encapsulates or encompasses the, the smaller structures and it gets moved. And that stuff works perfectly well in traditional computer science. And it's like, why would you want want to throw away all those fabulous tools just because you have this other tool. What you really should be thinking about is how I put these tools together. And the, the symbolic stuff, I think, gives a chance of representing some of the richer priors that we want um, if we can get it into a nice framework so that we can take advantage of some of the ideas about learning and being responsive to data and so forth. So this distinction between system one and system two thinking, um, which is often associated with Kahneman, um, has come up in these AI debates that you've been organizing in the past couple of years. And in the first AI debate, this was sort of, I think, became quite a uh, visible you know, takeaway or talking point. Um, but this year, I think there was some kind of qualification um, that Kahneman made to maybe the sort of rulelessness of um, system one thinking. Could you just talk a little bit about how useful or not this analogy really is? So I loved Kahneman's remarks at the debate. It was one of the highlights. Um, the point that he was making is, now we're just talking about humans, not AI systems. But if you look at humans, it would, it would be tempting to say, okay, system one, this kind of reflexive thing, is kind of like a neural network and the classic neural network that doesn't have rules and symbols. I call those a limited connection of systems. Um, and system two looks a lot like it's manipulating rules and you know, like it's the kind of stuff that you use um, in formal reasoning and formal logic. And the point that he made is it's not as simple as that. So even what we think of as system one that's reflexive and so forth is actually more sophisticated um, than some of the neural network systems that we have now. And actually does seem like it can take on board a fair degree of abstraction and so forth. It does whatever it does very quick. Maybe it's not as flexible about how it does it, but you know, there's probably rules there. Um, the way I think about it related to his point is that a lot of language seems to be kind of system one in the sense that it's reflexive, it's automatic. You know, it's it actually like, you know, to teach a child what an adverb is, is complicated. Like it's not like it's not obvious to us as ordinary human beings. So it's kind of system one -y kind of stuff that certainly looks like it. it's governed by rules um, that, you know, you can learn a rule like I can stick any adverb here and you can start putting in new adverbs and you can derive the meanings of things. Um, and so I think there's plenty of reason to agree with the point that Kahneman made and to, to think that. System one actually itself uses multiple pieces. And I'll give you a, a further thought on that. My graduate work was with Steven Pinker. And what we were working on is a very narrow question, about as narrow as I can imagine. 
which was how do children learn the past tense of English verbs? And you've got some that are irregular and some that are regular. Um, so sing goes to sang in the past tense. I, you know, I like to sing every day. Yesterday I sang. Um, whereas walk goes to walked. You add ed to it. And the conclusion that we came after, you know, lots of work, part of which was my dissertation and some other students' dissertations and so forth, was that there were actually two systems just involved there and, and a principle for mediating them. So we argued that the irregulars looked like a neural network of the kind that was there and kind of the predecessor to deep learning. Deep learning didn't have that name yet, but they were, they were kind of proto-deep learning systems. Um, there was one hidden layer instead of many. And those seem to do a good job for the irregular verbs, but you really needed a rule for the regulars. And part of the evidence for that was you could generalize the regular even to words that didn't sound like anything else you knew. So for an adult, I can say, um, I love rouge. I love putting rouge on my face. Every day I like to rouge. Yesterday, I, and then you fill it in, yesterday I rouged. Well, that doesn't rhyme with another word, right? But you can figure out because you have this, what we call default rule that you could use generally. And so the point is that's like a super narrow corner of, of English. And yet, even there, there was evidence, even the youngest children that we could, or almost youngest children we could look at, um, by the time kids were about two and a half, they had learned this rule, and they were already using the rule differently from the associations they were, sort of neural network-like associations that they were using for the irregulars. So it would be no surprise that in system one as a whole, that of course, these tools get used over and over again. It, it's sort of like if I were looking at a house and I discovered what a screw was, and what a board was, I'd be super excited, but that wouldn't really mean that I knew everything about it or that there was one part of the house that was only boards or one part that was only screws, right? You're going to put these things together in patterns and you're probably going to want, you know, to have nails and you're probably going to want concrete and you're going to want, you know, fiberglass insulation. There's actually going to be a lot of things that can get reused in different ways, depending on which room you're making, what kind of building. Um, I think it's going to turn out that way for, uh, human brains, and ultimately we're going to need something analogous for AI. You, you really need a lot of different tools put together in a, in a multiplicity of ways. It's not going to be one ring that rules them all. Intelligence is actually complicated. Um, I like quoting this thing from Chaz Firestone and, and Brian Scholl, um, which I think is quoted in, in Rebooting AI in the book. Um, it's something like, um, cognition is not one thing but many. I don't remember their examples, but it's sort of like, you know, part of it is vision, part of it is reasoning, part of it is um, putting those things together in different contexts and so forth. And it's just a mistake to think for more than a minute that any homogenous solution to intelligence is going to work because the problem itself is so heterogeneous. And I think it's also a mistake to think that any in any macro level system, like parsing a sentence or um, playing a guitar, that you're only going to use one mechanism. It's even, you know, like take guitar, like you've got motor control, but also like um, if, if you're reasonably sophisticated, you have some understanding of music theory um, and understanding of the relation between the notes and how they fit into uh, a scale and, you know, how you're thinking about the rhythm. And so, you know, there, there's a whole bunch of things just going into the act of playing guitar, which I wrote a book about and, uh, at, at one point. Um, it, almost any interesting activities is going to require the coordination of multiple components. And, you know, AI should be partly about how we coordinate many things rather than just what those individual components are, I think. And so is this, is this an approach to building AI that you're using um, in, your, in your new company and robust, robust AI? In, in part. So, I mean, we are certainly interested in, first of all, having a... Um, a broad set of mechanisms rather than one. We, we don't think there's one single mechanism. Um, and we're interested in how to coordinate all of those and get the most out of them. We think that, that you're going to get intelligence out of taking the best available tools and putting them in the best possible way rather than being doctrinaire and saying, I like this one the best and I'm going to run with it. Like We just don't think that that's plausible. Gary, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been great chatting to you. Uh, great, great to be here. That was Gary Marcus discussing his new book, Rebooting AI, Building Artificial Intelligence We Can Trust. On the next episode of Technology and Prose, I'll be joined by Nick Diakopoulos to discuss his book, Automating the News, How Algorithms Are Rewriting the Media. The design challenge is like figuring out, well, what are machines good at? What are people good at? And like, 
how do we actually fit those pieces together into information production processes or workflows that accomplish the things that we want to accomplish and which meet the performance expectations that we have of journalism. Thank you for listening and until next time.